Hello everyone, today we'll be moving to the fourth episode about OAuth 2 and I will be talking about authentication between a machine and another machine. We In the in our previous three videos we talk about when a user is involved. So we need somehow a user name and a password, so a user needs to authenticate and then later that the there can be or not an authentication between machine to machine. But in this case, it's for those scenarios when you are in a company and you have a machine that needs to access APIs in another machine. There is no user involved. But the issue here is that should I create a user to authenticate on the other side or should I create a different mechanism? And OAuth 2 provides a different mechanism, which is this flow, which is called client credentials flow, where you don't have to store a user's username and password, but to what you, the only thing that you need to do is to provide a client ID and the client secret that should be generated on your single sign-on server and store them uh, in the most safest way possible on the, in the machine that needs to use that secret. Of course, it's not a good idea to keep the secret on the machine that will work as a client, even if it's protected. The best place to put these uh, secrets, let's say like this, can be in the environment variables when the when the system starts or maybe in a vault like HashiCorp or similar. So all don't use or don't store any secret on the machine because if someone can take the file, they can attack that, fi that file and try to guess or even if it's encrypted, uh, the, the, the secret, there is always a risk. And if it's not there, it cannot be stolen. But let's see, it's a quite simple flow, but quite effective when you need, let's say, an application to connect to an API on another application, which happens, for instance, in batch and process that uh, they use behind the scenes, a cron that needs to access multiple machines and collect resource to some transformation and push later the information to other systems. It's the best flow for those scenarios. So first, a little a little introduction. So far, we have discussed flows where a user authorizes an application to access the resources. And there were three previous videos to talk about. I invited you to uh, check them if uh, you need some somehow a kind of username, password authentication. If that's not the case, you can start right away, right away with uh, this flow. But this one, as I said previously, it's about machine to machine communication where the resource owner it's the client application itself. And just to remember what's happening here, when you have the OAuth 2, there are always two entities somehow when you have a machine in the middle. So you have a person that has a username and password that wants to authenticate and wants to delegate some authority or some authorization to another entity. It can be, for instance, a machine. So in those cases, you authenticate, uh, there will be a token provided to you, and then you they give this token to a machine so it can communicate with other systems. But of course, in this way, you can access any machine on, on any infrastructure. So there is also the client ID and the client secret, meaning that in the single sign-on, it knows you. It means that the authorization server knows who you are because he understands and wants to validate your username and password, but he wants to validate also the client. So you can define clients that you accept to be integrated in this authentication authorization process. And these clients are client are call, are called clients and they 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 will be provided with an ID and a secret. So at the end of the day you have two entities that can be authenticated. It's you uh, as a person when you want to delegate some authorization to an application, but you also have to authenticate the client with a, where you have the client ID and the client secret. And there are flows where this client secret is important. There are other flows when, when, where this client secret is not important. And this one, it's the most important because we don't have the person here. So we'll have a machine. So the most important entity here, it's the machine. And of course, the client ID and the client secret. And this client ID and this client secret will be, let's say, the user and the password for that application. So it means that the machine will work as a kind of a human, authenticated itself with the ID and the, um, the secret that were provided at authorization server. This is a spoiler alert about how this flow works. So let's move on. So what are the actors here? The cast is much smaller than the previous flow that we saw because there is no person here. So we have the client application, which is the software application that needs to access a protected resource, usually APIs, which is a client, uh, it's a machine one that wants to access a resource server that contains APIs, which is the machine two. And you need, of course, a middleman to mediate all of these and authorize, which is the authorization server, the service that authenticates the client, not the person now, 
and the issues and access token mean that there is no human intervention here. So it's every time the machine wants to connect to a resource, it requests a token and to request a token, it needs to provide an ID and the password, it will receive an access token that allows the client application, meaning the machine one, to access the machine two. In our case, will be in our case will be the resource server or the API that hosts the protected resource. So there is no resource owner, there is no user involved in this flow. That is why it's simple, but quite effective. So you can see from the flow, you have a client, it requests a token, you should pass on the parameters. The grant type equals equal client credentials, the client ID, the client secret, and the scope. The scope are the permissions that you are requesting. Meaning, I say, I, I want to access that API about uh, photos, and I just want to read. You can ask to if you can write, but on the authorization server, maybe has the, something to say. This client cannot write on these APIs. They cannot call the APIs with uh, that uh, have a scope about write. So think of scopes, if you are new to this, as a kind of permissions that you give to the application. Don't misunderstand with the person. You can have permissions to a person and you can have permissions to a client, which is the application. It's completely different. It's what a user can do. You can be an admin, but uh, for instance, you, the application that you are using doesn't have permission, for instance, to create things on a resource server, even if you are admin. Th there is no intersection between these, these things. They are completely different entities when in this in the, in the flows of auto so you request access token you ask for the client credentials it will return an access token of course if the client id and client secret are valid on the authorization server and then you use the access token to access the resource server and you receive data it is as simple as this it's the most simple one that you can use there is a simpler one but for person that is similar to this one that i will create a video later about it so the steps is usually the client application makes a direct server to server, meaning a post request to the authorization server's token endpoint and authenticates using client ID and client secret. As I said, it works as a kind of a username and password, but for an applications, of course, you, you should send what type of flow are you uh, involved with. And in our case, it's a client credentials. Otherwise, the single sign-on doesn't understand what you really want. Because if it's an authorization flow, he expects to provide the username and password to a user. If you ask its client credentials, the authorization server understands that, okay, I will take the client ID and client secret and I'll validate them before I provide uh, uh, a token to, for, for the application to access the resource server. So it can be something similar to this. So you have the post, you say you, the host of the server, content type. But at the end of the day, this is optional. It can be on the authorization, the client ID and client city encoded, or you can provide it here. Some people prefer here because here it's completely clear, even if it's a JSON. Of course, we expect for you to use HTTPS. So there is no middleman looking to what's happening in the communication. But if you want more a safe, a safer approach, you can use authorization and remove from here the client ID and client secret. It's a question of test. Now you receive the access token. There is no refresh token here. You just receive the access token. The type is usually bear, the, exp the expiration, and the scopes that you are allowed to use. Meaning that every time you uh, go to an API, the scopes go with access token and the API will say if you can access or call that API or not. Um, the access token gives you permission to access the resource server, but it doesn't mean that you have access to all the APIs. The scopes will, will establish what are your authorization, your permissions to access those APIs. You can see there is no refresh token here because if it expires, you just request a new one. Remember that you are a machine. You can request uh, using client ID and client secret a new token every time you want. There is no need for a refresh token. Now you access the protected resource and it returns the data that you want. You usually you do something like this. You just uh, remember to add the, the header on your request authorization, the word bearer. The word bearer is it's because of this. You can see here that is returned to you. And then you provide here the access token and you expect for the best from the resource. Oh, no. Let's see a simple code example in Python. It's quite simple to understand. You need the client ID, client secret, the token endpoint where you get the token, the resource that you want to access. You can put here your uh, API that you want to access and the scopes that you require to for this client to access this resource. You create a method called the get access token. Of course, you provide those values, the grant types. Don't, don't forget it's client credentials. 
your client ID, client secret, the scopes, the other, it's, uh, it should be this one because you are, you are doing a, a request here and now you get the response after you and you, you receive a payload and on the payload you can get the access token and the expires in. Of course, this is JSON that you receive here in Python. It's quite simple. You just say that you want the JSON and you get it as if you work some, some similar to JavaScript. That's one of the things I like about Python. And going back, you can see the answer to the payload are the access token, the token type, and the expire. So you can get it directly from the JSON as the on a first level, meaning that you have the property name and the value. And that's why here, you can just take it directly with get access token, get expires. You return these two values is something that Python supports, so returning multiple values. And then if you look into the to, to the main before calling this API, you can see here that token uh, and then expires, you receive these two, and then you call your API and you just need a token there. Okay, and it's this method called protected API, receive the token. And again, don't forget to add authorization bear with your access token. You expect probably to be just, it's not mandatory. It can be XML or other format, but usually it's JSON nowadays. And now you just do the request. You pass the others information that you want and you expect for the best. So you should have a result here if your scopes are compatible with the ones accepted by the API. It is, it is as simple as this. And this example should work almost out of the box. Of course, you have to put your real, real data and real servers. You can use, for instance, GitHub. GitHub allows you to create a client ID that you can access later if you want. It's just, uh, or otherwise you can use servers like Keyclock and things like that, that they open source to install in your machine using a container and you can test uh, these kind of things there, okay? So security considerations, client secret uh, security. Remember that it's a machine to machine, the client secret, it's there. It's like uh, you have to, to, to have the client secret available on the machine. So uh, protect it as, uh, as, as best as you can because it's the only credential for the application's identity. You don't need uh, anything else. So if someone can stole the client secret, it can use it to in any place because there is no validation on the machine. Of course, there are mechanisms if you are using cloud and, the other, uh, and um, you have a good architecture to say, I only allow requests from this IP and that it will be a great additional measure for security. But if it's not the case, be careful where you store this client secret. Of course, don't put it on the code, configuration files and things like that. Usually try to put environment variables. If you are in containers, pass this to, uh, to the, uh, usually the cloud support a way to pass secrets, but they are encrypted even if someone has access even to your cloud area, cannot see the secrets after they are stored uh, uh, and start to execute it. And uh, of course, always use uh, transport security HTTPS. Otherwise, you, you, can, you can do the best, but if I can sniff the network and if it's not HTTPS, I can see the secret passing through the through the network. The scope limitation request only the minimum necessary scope for the application functionality. It's always a good practice. Regarding security, always the minimum as possible. Rate limiting, this is not only for authentication, but for other uh, any access to the API, try to guess how many requests do you receive in a, in some short range of time and make sure that the, the, there are no abuse uh, because at the end of the day, it can also prevent attacks and things like that to, to, to your API. And of course, have a great error handling. And I will say more, don't log secrets. If you have to log something, they say, but I have to log something to check later if there was a problem or not. In those, in those cases, Ash it at least because if you if you have to compare something you can ask all, always to someone to say okay I don't want you to give me the password but ash your password and give me your the the, the result so I can compare with my log in in, in this case there is no reason no 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 necessity to share any secret or password it's a good strategy to use all the time and it's trustable for anyone. So advantage of the client credentials flow, it's simple. It is more simple than this. It's, it's difficult. There, there are no user involvement for the good or for the worse, depending how you, how secret will you keep the client secret. Uh, strong authentication for clients relies on client secret to authenticate the application itself. And the final gr uh, granular control, 
the scopes allow authorization service to grant specific limited permissions to client applications. This is great because you have a central place authorization server. You can say this machine can only access these APIs with these restrictions, even even without the intervention of a human. It is uh, it, it, it's a quite nice addition. So when not to use client credentials when a user when a human user is involved. If that's the case. Return to my previous three flows, and you have three different ways to use a user. When you have a user, there is always a problem. Pro the problem is probably you are in an application or in a browser, places where you don't want to store the client secret. And if you don't store the client secret, it means that you cannot send the client secret. So there should be a different way. And that, that's why there are different flows that you, you can see in my previous videos. And, and, and the way, uh, usually these flows, they have always an additional step to make sure first that you are the person that starts the whole conversation, and then later probably a machine will send the client secret. But after the single sign-on understands who you are. So first accepts you, and then it will do the same as this machine to machine to make sure that the client is also accepted. And this, of course, what I'm saying applies to public clients like mobile applications, browser based single page applications, and things like that, again, because they cannot store the client secret. Conclusion, the client credentials. So it's a workhorse for server to server machine to machine authorization. Of course, the weakness, it's the client secret. That's the point of, it's a critical point for security, but it's, it's, a, it's a safe flow. If you can keep the secret well protected on a machine or in a vault, uh, in, in a way that it's very difficult for a human or even a process to get it and move it to another place and explore it, that will be a great flow that you can use between two when one machine needs to as, as access resource on another machine. So this is the flow that I want to present you. It was faster than the other ones. It's simpler than the other ones, but it's not less than the others. It's uh, quite useful when you have a machine to machine. It, it is as strong as the other flows that we saw earlier. Uh, the only difference is that there is no human, just machine to machine. And again, remember the critical point, it's how you store and protect the client secret. If it's vulnerable, yeah, the flow doesn't... Uh, the, the, there will there will be no value in using this flow. So this is what I want to present. I hope you are following these uh, videos about how oh, to. I'm creating other videos. If you are following my channel, if you are not, please subscribe, follow it, like it, share with your friends. It's always a motivation to me, and I hope to see you in my next video.